everybody. I hope that you guys are having a great week. I hope that no matter what's going on, that you're uh, committed to pushing through. Uh, I am here to share with you on something I am immensely um, passionate about. And if you followed me for any stretch of time over the years, you know that I've been consistent in my message, consistent in my push, consistent in my movement and giving uh, to my uh, my people and the black community in multitudinous ways. And um, this is, again, in the middle of a fundraising push. Before I get started, look, if you believe in what I've done over the years, if you followed me and you believe in what I've done, go to the description box, look at the top of the, des the description box and give. Use one of those mechanisms uh, through which you can give, whether it's clicking the link, whether it's through the organization's cash app, but show your love, show your support and give. And for those who are wondering why you should help, why you should give, why you should get behind uh, something like the Odyssey Project and the work that I specifically do in the uh, Odyssey Project, I put together what I am referring to as the state of black America in a synopsis. Uh, I want to talk about why this is important and why what we do is important. I believe in the concept of discovery and solutions. In other words, I don't do research uh, just so I can regurgitate what I've learned. I don't do research so that I can have philosophical debates. I don't do research to be the person to sit up and beat my chest and stroke my ego. I do research for the purpose of discovery for the for the reason of creating solutions in other words it means nothing to be able to talk about it and not have a solution so you need to identify the origin of your problems and then you address the origin with meaningful work and evidence-based solutions and so what we tend to find ourselves complaining about are the symptoms of the reality and not the causality and because we aren't familiar with the causality we tend to find ourselves frustrated by our discomfort frustrated uh, by our inability to exact change change comes first and foremost from within even when there are forces outside of yourself moving against you the old African proverb says that if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. What I'm going to do is I'm not going into a comprehensive discussion here, but I am going to do a step by step synopsis of some of the major points of what's going on and why we need to be more united and invested in making things ch uh, pushing for change. Uh, and I'm going to do it systematically, uh, but I don't want to take too much of your time. But again, um, I'm hoping that you can see the need for us to come together and work together. I'm hoping that you see the need uh, for the work that I've done now for 30 years. Uh, we're going to start with socioeconomics. And I'm going to explain to you why socioeconomics is so important. Because every uh, concept, idea, or point I'm going to make here is majorly impacted by economics is majorly impacted by your socioeconomic status and blacks are in last place in every socioeconomic category so what is in truth socioeconomics you hear the term socioeconomics is a branch of science that studies the impact of uh, local regional national and global economics on the progression of any particular social group and it can be race, it can be uh, religion, it can be geolocale, it can be a bunch of different things. In this case, when we talk socioeconomics, we're talking race-based and specifically the function as it pertains to what's going on in this particular country. And so we're looking at uh, how does the economics and where you are socioeconomically impact 
your social mobility, your social progress, your social growth, so that you can flourish in life in the areas of social engagement, social advancement, and everything that has to do with dealing with other people and benefiting other people, benefiting from other people, uh, impacting other people. All of that is social from the family structure, the community structure, the job structure, all of these things are social. So then you have to understand how your economics do it. So then what we know first and foremost is while we have been uh, what I would call quasi liberated uh, since 1865, 100 and what, 57 years, something like that, 157, almost 58 years now, um, quite, we've been quasi liberated. Uh, there hasn't been any real true progression. Matter of fact, the wealth gap has actually widen uh the wealth gap now if we're talking whites and blacks we're talking 177 thousand per median household wealth for whites and 17 thousand median household for blacks uh we're talking about uh per capita uh for more blacks uh closer to the poverty line not in total number but in per capita percentage of who we are in this particular country uh, so then everything stems from the impotence that comes from that lack of power that comes with wealth so we know for a fact that economics provides mobility economics provides power ep economics provides access and so then we ask ourselves what comes out of being in last place poor educational models poor ability to recognize opportunities and respond to them uh, poor economics to advance our children, the disintegration of the family nucleus, uh, which also creates even more strain on the black black economic uh, compass. And so what we have is a situation where our economic situation is worsening. While we may have the illusion of doing better, while we may have more black people in our minds living in suburbia, uh, the true nature of it is the total the totality of the 45 million plus anywhere from 45 million to 48 million uh, plus that represent African Americans and blacks in this country and we ask ourselves how does the collective set in in totality this we are normally and often seen or paraded in front of the masses and the, the 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 message is if they can do it why can't you do it and the argument is we're in a post-racial america when the racial caste system and all of its tenets are institutionalized into the very fabric of this nation its policies its statutes uh its corporations its boardrooms all there so when one makes it um, the one doesn't represent the whole, the one represents a unique situation. So what we must do is we must create our own situations. Uh, we can talk about, when we talk about the dis disintegration of the black family, we're talking about the capacity through which we literally inculcate our values, interests, and principles into the psyche of our youth. We consistently talk about our youth being uh, our future. The children are the future, but we don't adequately prepare and empower them to really go out into a world that's inherently hostile to them so that they can compete, not only compete, but win. Uh, when I wrote my 16th book, Lord, a while back, uh, when I wrote that book, uh, The Miseducation of Black Youth in America, I defined education as being the holistic preparation and empowerment of black youth to go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and compete and win and that preparation starts with a sense of identity it starts with them understanding who they are it starts with them having a set of values interests and principles inculcated into their minds their psyches literally to the depths of their social their souls or their uh, subconscious that anchor them in a behavior that's pro-social to them and the group when you don't do that you are pulled by a yearning to belong a yearning to have things and you are often misled and misguided by those that benefit from you being lost and this has happened generation after generation for us because we have not solidified a universal idea of how we're going to educate our children simultaneously the black family has been under assault uh, so that there isn't this holistic 
environment with masculine energy and feminine energy so that we can build. And people say, well, what do we do about that? We have to reprioritize the black family, the black marriage, black love. We have to prepare both black boys and black girls to have a mindset to connect and to build and to operate in the roles that they were designed to operate in so that they can exemplify the power that they possess to accomplish exceptional and extraordinary things together. We have to give value back to marriage, value back to uh, commitment and honor. We must build something that we can literally anchor our people in. Without family, there's no structure. Without structure, there's no guidance. There's no accountability. There's no, no, no certainty of responsibility, place, and purpose. We are going to have to deal with that. And one of the best places to do it is in the un, um, tainted mind of young people. So that's why I created the Black Men Lead Rite of Passage Initiative. That's why we have other uh, initiatives to deal with young girls. That's why we deal with programs that provide uh, reinforcement on what we should be doing as a people because it's in those early stages of development that there's no resistance. There's no toxicity of erroneous ideas about who they are they they see what it is this is where you teach them to love themselves this is where you teach them to be the best version of themselves to strive to be better this is where you invest in them and create a love for reading reading and learning and discovery so that they're always seeking the better version the better chance the better opportunity there's a desire to know and to be better and that starts early the longer you leave them to the wiles of the system, the wiles of this uh, exogenous force that's coming at them, the more they will be miseducated, misguided, misled, and they will begin to become misunderstood even by themselves. It's our responsibility to build. It's our responsibility to grow something. Uh, when we talk about uh, poor education models, we're talking also about the disproportionality of special, edu special, special education referrals for young black boys, which uh, actually urges them into the school to prison pipeline. Why? Because as early as five years old, they are being disproportionately uh, referred for special education assessments and the signed IEPs in, first, in special education tags, which follow them throughout school, alienate them from the general population in most instances, put them in hostile environments where they don't feel accepted, where they don't feel cared for, and they begin to become alienated and it increases their risk for dropping out. Once they drop out, we know they are five times more likely to become incarcerated. Once they are incarcerated, we know they are 72% likely to recidivate in the first three years and even higher in the first five years because there are no programs, because there are no programs that are preparing them to withstand what's going on. We are not building and socializing young black boys. And then what happens also because of that is they have a higher proclivity towards violence. I've done an extensive study into African-American adolescent and young adult male violence to understand the best route and the best way to mitigate, to mitigate uh, violence and, and it's possible again through proper racial socialization I t I've shared this with you before there are five primary um, influences the five top influences of violence in young black males whether it's adolescent or young adult males is number five urban hassle all the things that happen in the inner city from sirens and in 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 activity all times of the night um gunfire all times of the day and night, navigating gang violence, nav navigating drug activity, uh, and, and all of the other things that happen on the inner city that creates an agitation to their nervous system. It increases the proclivity towards violence. Second, I mean, number four is witnessing violence. The more they witness violence, the more insensitive they become, desensitized they become to it. Also, it becomes a model of problem solving for them. They are literally watching. This is what happens when somebody doesn't do what you want to do. This is what happens when someone says something you don't like. This is what happens, happens, happens. And it becomes a model for conflict resolution. 
Number three is being a victim of violence. You become a victim of violence. You again, you become desensitized to it, but you also are being taught that when something doesn't go your way, even violence in the home by parents, uh, when something doesn't go your way, you hit somebody. And so they, they get that. Then the second way is the lack of proper racial socialization. What is socialization? It is the preparation in a mental and emotional capacity in the development of a youth to understand who they are, what they're capable of doing, what their roles are in society, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what their responsibilities are, how they're going to live out of their life, what it's going to look like as they progress towards adulthood, what they will be expected to do once they become adults. All of this is socialization. We know for a fact that when we properly racially socialize young black males, they not only don't drop out, become criminals, and they stop being likely to commit violence. Uh, they also become more successful later in life. They, they, they're able to develop skill sets that lead them to being um, capable of uh, sustaining a livable lifestyle and raising a family. This is immensely important. Uh, also sustaining that family. This is immensely important. And all of these things are things that we can do. These are things that we have the possibility. What I want to see in the next year or two is the universalization of an agenda. And in this particular place, a universalization of a rite of passage across this country with a universal definition of manhood so that everybody is operating on the same standard where everybody knows how to hold one another accountable to what we should be doing in the community as men and we need programs also to address the needs of our young ladies our babies need to know who they are they need to understand that they're beautiful they need to understand that they're powerful that they're intelligent that they're valuable that they're precious that they don't need to aspire to anything else but the best version of themselves and that in that they have this uniqueness and this un 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 unbelievable strength that is so vital to the nurture and nature of our people that it's constantly under attack and we need to be teaching that. We can get into that socioeconomics and I can go on for days just in socioeconomics, which also impacts health. When we talk about health, the first thing that I look at is I look at multi-generational trauma and how it's been transmitted epigenetically and through social learning theory and through re-injury. Uh, epigenetically, through epigenetic tags and impressions, trauma is literally cemented into the cellular makeup on a genetic level. And it is literally uh, passed down through procreation uh, and depending on, dependent upon the severity of the trauma, how much of the tag is not disposed of through um, uh, meiotic, uh, meiotic uh, cellular reproduction, which is uh, a cellular reproductive process for the reproductive system. And so we we get into this, this stuff. And I, like I said, I've done research on it. I've been talking about it for years. It's also tied to adverse childhood experiences. It's also tied to um, uh, poor health outcomes. Uh, epigenetics is an explanation to why we have so many of our diseases, autoimmune diseases, um, other 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 inabilities to fight disease cancer a large number of cancers can be tied to environmental stressors that are supportive of trauma so all of these things come in but we also have in addition to like the adverse childhood experiences which address specifically experiences that our youth go through as minors that play out in their health come outcomes at uh, uh, health outcomes to uh, Wait a minute, I lost my lost my train of thought. So, the epigenetic to health outcomes. So here here's what here's what we're going to we'll get get back on on track. So then we get uh, these adverse childhood experiences can be anything from parents breaking up, neglect, abuse, 
um, and uh, I've named them all before, neglect, abuse, ch a parent being uh, addicted to a chemical substance, um, a parent becoming incarcerated or otherwise leaving the home, a parent being abused or being abusive. All of these are adverse childhood experiences and they play out over the course of the life of the child. We need to address that. We also have to deal with mental illness. Uh, our, our women are more likely to suffer depression than men and black women are the leading uh, victims of depression and are the least likely to, out of those, out of women are the least likely to seek intervention. We need to deal with that. We need to deal with the fact that we are experiencing a spike in suicide in the black community among young black males ages 14 to 24, or young black girls ages 5 to 13. I've talked about this in depth in previous videos, so I'm not going to go in depth to it now, but that's definitely should be, should be something alarming and we need to be in a situation where we can readily address it. We have to have the mechanisms and the means to do it. We cannot depend upon a system who has not served us to this point to do something for us that we have the capacity to do it for ourselves. One of the things that we're going to have to develop is a mindset to be able to do for ourselves, a mindset to say, okay, here's the issue. How do we solve it? We need think tanks. We need think tanks that focus, focus specifically on different areas for every one of the problems I'm talking about. That should be a think tank that focuses specifically on that. And the minds need to come together. Financial minds need to come together. Uh, minds that deal with behavior and social uh, realities and situations and consequences need to come together. Uh, political minds need to come together. Uh, academic and minds and people who have backgrounds in education need to come together. We need to come together in community building, in wealth building, and all of these different areas that needs to be these think tanks that come together that produce the results. We're not going to wish our way out of this. We're not going to uh, uh, guilt them on some standard of morality of what they are not doing or what they are supposed to be doing or what they should do. Uh, it is immensely important that we actually uh, take action ourselves. And then we haven't even got into politics, the disenfranchisement, the two-party system and the confusion therein and all of the other things I talked about the two-party system. I'm actually going to do an entire presentation on the two-party system, how we went from being predominantly Republican uh, from from the point of Lincoln to being predominantly Democrat and how um, it all plays into where we're at right now, what we're actually seeing, what we're actually getting, the games that are played, what 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 is the outcome that we're looking for and how do we create it in the two party system? Is it possible? Uh, you have to understand when we talk about the two party system, it's often referred to as the right wing and the left wing. And I often say that, hey, that right wing and that left wing belong to the same bird. And that bird has been shitting on the head of black people uh, for 400 years, since 1619 uh, at least. And so that we need to have a clear understanding of how we move forward. We need to come together. Unity has to be the answer. Uh, how are we doing it at the Odyssey Project? Number one, through our research center, which has logged over 100,000 plus hours of research I've logged over the course of my 35 years of legitimate research, uh, over 80,000. And it's very important that you understand when we talk about research, we're not talking about just the time it takes to pull out extant data and uh, uh, empirical evidence that exists. It's about also having the capacity to create studies, to generate data and information that we can study and learn. It's about adding to what's already out there and building upon what was given to us so that we create the solutions, uh, that we take what Dr. Wilson gave us, what Dr. Wilson gave us, what Dr. Ogbar gave us, what Dr. DeGray gave us, and we build on that, that we grow that Dr. Howard Stevenson and so many others in the area of performance and psychology, Franz Fanon and on and on, Chancellor, we, all the people that we look at and we say, okay, these were our master teachers. They weren't trying to iconize uh, or, or become icons 
in, 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 in our minds. They were trying to set the stage. It was meant for us to pick up the baton and move beyond it and, 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 and become forces within ourselves of change. It's not about simple debate. It's not about standing on the stage and regurgitating what you know. It's about, it, you, you, there are times to do that. You need to inform people. You need to teach people. There are lecture, times I lecture. There are times that I teach, there are times that I hold workshops and conferences to help people and empower people. But you have to have a system built if you're going to fight a system. Each of us can't fight a system from an individualized mindset. We have to fight it from a collective mindset operating from with, within a system we create to protect us, to cover us, to push us, to guide us, to literally systemize everything that we're trying to go. So the research center is about that. And that that's so important. Uh, program development. Program development is the taking of what we discover in our research and creating solutions to the problem in programs that we invite people into and we teach them, we train them, we grow them, we we get engaged. It's so many different things that comes into program development that we've done over the years. Then there's program implementation. The implementation is taking the program you create and actually putting it to work. And I can tell you that the programs we created work. The problem we have is we don't have the resources to push them further out. We need to be dealing with way more people we're dealing with. I have a list of people who have come for help that we simply don't have the resources to serve. And I am no longer in a position where I can just go out and fund it totally on my own. So then that means we are going to have to come together and make it happen. We want to be able to reach people and serve people. We also want to be able to reach people and empower people. We want to create programs that are built by us for us. And I can't I cannot stress the importance of that. Even in the very simplistic nature of teaching, we know for a fact that there's a wealth of data out there, evidence that shows that when a child is being taught by someone they can identify with, someone who looks like them, someone who comes from their culture, they fare extremely better than when they're taught by someone who does not look like them and does not come from their culture. And there are a number of different reasons why. We need to manage this. We need to be aware of this and we need to move in it. Uh, again, I go back to universalization, uh, and that's where I'm going to end this thing. We need to create a universal uh, mechanism of engagement. One over here and one over there and one over there isn't going to do it. We need to have this in all of the cities, and they need to be interconnected. There need to be chapters, and they need to have a universal uh, standard of what's being done in how we are training our boys, how we're training our girls, how we're supporting homes, how we are uh, being proactively engaged in building and rebuilding and restoring the black family. All of these things are immensely important, but it starts with a step. It starts with getting out there. It starts with saying, you know what, this is where we start. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. We are going to go in and make things happen there are so many things going on it's so it's so easy to become distracted it's so easy to be honest to be um untrusting it's so easy to sit up and say this but at the bottom line the work has to be done the work has to be done so again you i, I i'm not gonna even give a number but what i'm gonna tell you is just think about the things i sit up and said and just give yourself an idea and ask what could it possibly cost for this stuff to be done on a daily basis uh, to provide services to people who are struggling with mental illness, to provide services to people who are caught up in a system where their child has been uh, wrongfully assigned uh, an IEP or a special education tag, and now you're trying to figure out how to get them out of them because it's easy to get them in, it's hard to get them out of. How do we deal with what's going on in domestic violence? How do we deal with depression? How do we deal with uh, the lack of social mobility and the need to build more businesses and, and to fight off gentrification, to fight off uh, serial force displacement and all of the things that we are dealing with on a regular basis. Where does it start? It starts first in the mind of saying, you know what, I'm going to be a part of the solution. 
I'm not going to sit idly by and complain. I'm not going to sit idly by and type, oh my God. I'm not going to sit idly by and type, shaking my head and complain about what's going on with my people. I'm going to become actively involved, whether it's starting a program myself, whether it's finding one that I believe in and giving or uh, finding one I believe in and participating. But the goal has to be to become active and take action. None of this stuff just happens by osmosis. It takes resources. It it takes time. It takes commitment. And I've been hammering at this for 30 plus years. I'm asking you to support. Uh, this is just the basis of what's going on. But we, we are in a state of crisis. And we're going in the wrong direction, by the way. Financially, things are getting worse. Uh, politically, things are getting worse. Uh, in, 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 in the sense of serial force displacement, we are being scattered and dispersed consistently uh we have a problem and there is a solution and we have to we have to man up we have to take the reins we have to be willing to do something about it so that's my challenge um again i am going to do everything in my power to be a force as long as i've got breath in my body i'm going to press uh but i am asking and challenging each of you to show your love show your support and give to what we're trying to do with an understanding of the gravity of what it is we're actually trying to do. Um, this is no small order, but it's absolutely necessary. This isn't about uh, luxury or excess. This is about the essentials of progression and survival if we're ever going to be a people who are truly liberated. On that note, I'm out of here. For those who will give, I do thank you in advance. On that note, take care of yourself. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. I'm free to be